Awesome. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. I'm sorry I have to wear a mask. I'm not feeling too well, so just want to be careful. Um, OK, so I, I will talk today about a kind of new way to do quantum computing with neutral atoms. Um, I was going to talk about a completely different topic, but then there was so much excited, excitement about neutral atoms that I decided to talk about this. Um, so before I begin the talk, I have to, of course, acknowledge all the students and all our collaborators. Uh, and, you know, I'm thankful to them for uh, all the discu discussions I've had. Um, especially Jeff Thompson, so the work with neutral atoms has really been pioneered uh, for, for, uh, in my collaborative space. <laughs> the work in neutral atoms is really pioneered uh, by Jeff Thompson's group in Princeton. Okay. The kind of uh, neutral atom that we work with is different than the kind of neutral atom that you heard about yesterday. Uh, specifically, we are interested in uh, metastable ytterbium qubit. So here, the qubit is encoded not in the ground space subspace of, the, of an atom, but it's encoded in a metastable subspace. So this is some, you know, just you have your atomic spectrum. Uh, this is some some uh, metastable states over here, which we call zero and one. They're metastable, but they're still long-lived. Obviously not as long-lived as, as ground states, but still uh, several seconds. So now, uh, when, the at when, when the atom is in the metastable state, it doesn't really do anything. They don't interact. And so when I want two atoms to interact with each other, I need to excite them into the Rydberg state. So we excite the one state to the Rydberg state to do gates. And the Rydberg state, of course, has a you know, wide wave function. And so they can interact with each other to do your Rydberg blockade gates. Now, the main source of decoherence is the Rydberg atom leaking to the ground state subspace. Uh, so now uh, what we can do is that after the gate operation, we can actually check was the atom in the ground state subspace or not? If the atom was not in the ground state subspace, then I'm very confident that the gate happened correctly. Otherwise, there was something, something went wrong. So in order to do that, we just apply like a laser pulse uh, uh, to cause a transition to another level, the atom fluoresces, and we can detect it. Um, if I had instead chosen to encode the qubit in the ground state subspace, then the decay from the Rydberg state to the ground state subspace would have been non-detectable. So that would have been like a poly error. But now, this transition from Rydberg state to the ground state is detectable, and so this error is an erasure error. Now, there's some possibility that after the gate operation, the Rydberg stays, uh, the, the, the atom remains in the Rydberg state or it goes to some other state. And we have means to, uh, means to detect all of these possibilities. I just haven't shown you all of the other things that can happen over here for clarity. OK, so in this way, we are able to convert dominant noise in our qubit to erasure errors. So um, in particular, the atom goes to the Rydberg state only if, has, only if it had started in the one state. So we, if we detect the atom, after the gate in the ground state, that means that the atom must have started in the one state. So this is also a biased erasure, uh, which is effectively like the like we are measuring the atom in the in the z basis. So basically, after every uh, two qubit control z gate, uh, uh, there's a chance that you know your your atom your Rydberg state had decayed. So you apply a pulse to detect whether this happened or not. And this is erasure conversion. If uh, you detect that you know, this atom got leaked, then you just replace the atom with the fresh one in the one state and move on. This whole uh, error mechanism can be modeled as a identity or a Z error happening to your qubit with 50% probability. So we can, our, our rough uh, overall error model is like follows. We have some probability PE of erasures. And basically, in, uh, whenever there's an erasure, that's equivalent to saying I have an I or a Z with 50% probability. If there is no erasure, of course, there's some probability of poly error, because there's still some probability 
that the Rydberg atom actually decayed to the metastable subspace. It's still small, but it's non-zero. So in our paper uh, over here, we have predicted that we can get an erasure fraction of about 98%. That means 98% uh, of all errors are, is going to be erasure errors, detectable errors. Only 2% is going to be poly errors. Yes, it's mid-circuit. So uh, the pulse that we apply here, for example, to detect the population in the ground state doesn't affect the, the qubit subspace at all. They're, they're far detuned from each other. Uh, so what's the advantage of uh, erasure noise? I can look, uh, firstly, I can look at the quantum capacity and I can, I can uh, look at the, at least the lower bound of a quantum capacity threshold uh, and plot that as a function of the erasure fraction. And if I have biased erasures, uh, this number goes up as the erasure fraction. So if all errors are erasures, then I basically have 100% threshold. If all the errors are poly errors over here, it's about 20% threshold. Uh, compare that to a more general erasure model where erasure could have happened from either the zero state or the one state. Uh, in that case, the erasure threshold only goes up to about 50%. So what this is saying, that erasure noise, firstly, the right side of this graph is better than the left side. That means erasure errors is better than the poly errors. But most importantly, also bias erasure errors is better than a general erasure error. OK, so the other advantage of erasure noise is that if a code can correct for T poly errors, then it can correct for twice as many erasure errors. So the same size of the code can give you more bang for your buck. Uh, so this is why. If you have your qubit, if there's a way for you to just change your encoding such that the dominant noise becomes erasure noise, you should do that. There's some other advantages of um, this specific metastable qubit. Firstly, it has a fast uh, readout, which is destructive. So compared to the talk yesterday where the destructive readout was about 500 microsecond, here, the destructive readout is about 20 microsecond with a fidelity of about 99%. These numbers can be improved. Um, also, the nice thing is that this imaging of the atom for detection doesn't, happen, doesn't have to happen in like a far away readout zone, like uh, in the talk yesterday. And that's because when you read out, uh, you, you, uh, when you want to read out the atom, you basically take, you basically kick the one state out of your trap, essentially. And the zero state, you bring down to the ground state, and you image the ground state. So the, again, the atoms you don't want to read out are there in the trap. But they're at a different frequency than this uh, drive that you're going to apply to image uh, the, uh, you know, the target atoms. So you don't actually have to move them far away, because the scattered photons are at a completely diff different frequency. Um, uh, in deuterium atoms, fast, uh, well, re relatively fast, non-destructive measurements have been demonstrated as well. It's you know three to four milliseconds. Uh, high fidelity gates have been demonstrated. So single fidelity, a single qubit gate fidelity of 99.9 percent, .9%, two qubit gate fidelity of 99.3 percent. This number is actually from uh, a re this Nature paper recently. And this number is post erasure detection. So this paper actually did demonstrate erasure detection. At the moment, it is detecting only uh, this guy. Uh, it's not detecting some other parts where the, the Rydberg state actually branched into, just because the experiment wasn't at the moment set up for that. You need more lasers and things like that. Uh, so in the experiment, this number of 99.3% is post erasure detection, and about uh, about 40% of the, uh, uh, the erasure fraction was about 40%. But again, that was mainly because, you know, we didn't detect the other uh, states. And the hope is, is that in the next iteration of experiments, we hope to get a 90% uh, erasure fraction. Uh, also because of the fact that, you know, you can, uh, by, by separating, the, the qubit subspace from the subspace in which you do the readout and reloading of atoms, you can also easily do mid-circuit reloading of the atoms. 
So again, for mid-circuit reloading, you have to cool the atoms down, and all of the scattered photons are at a different frequency than the qubit frequency. Sorry. The same thing. Yeah. Exactly the same thing because it's the same way we do the readout. It's, it's detecting the ground state essentially. So in the experiment, you are using uh, the non destructive measurement uh, the 3.5 milliseconds or the. The non destructive measurement? So this paper did not do the non destructive measurement, it's a separate paper. Um, this paper only did the destructive measurement. <clears throat> okay. Um, so now how do we want to do error correction in the system? So like I said, the dominant source of error here is uh, bias erasures, which is like poly I or Z. So our first go-to thing is, well, what error correcting code has super high threshold for Z type noise? And that's our favorite XZZX surface code. People, people who invented it are right over here. Um, so the XCZX surface code uh, is like a regular surface code. Uh, you just have one type of stabilizers, which is a four-body XCZX operators acting on the qubits around each of the plaquette. Uh, the nice thing is that you can uh, make a rectangular lattice to choose the distance of protection you want against Z errors and X errors. So if you want, if you only have Z errors, then you can make this uh, dimension longer and this dimension shorter. In fact, if you only have Z errors, then you can choose dx to be 1 because there's no need to do any x correction and you basically get the repetition code. Um, okay, so how do you actually measure the stabilizers of the code? You put an NCLA qubit at the center and you do a bunch of C0 and C phase gates between the NCLA and the data qubits. So the C phase gate, you already described. Um, the dominant errors are our identity or Z errors. So a Z error out during the control phase gate Essentially, we'll, uh, for example, over here, we'll anti-commute with the stabilizers to its left and its right, and it'll create a syndrome uh, in the horizontal direction. Um, let's see what happens when you do the control NOT gate. In this system, the native way to do the control NOT gate is to sandwich the control phase gate with two Hadamards. So here, what happens is that if you actually have an erasure, you put in, okay, this is a rough picture, you, you saw an erasure, you know the atom came from the one state, you reinitialize the atom in the one state, but now an Hadamard would act on it, and it will convert the I or Z error to I or X error. So the control not gate, unfortunately, converts the I and Z error to I and X error. What that means is that um, a Z error during the control not gate now will actually start creating syndromes that go uh, up and down. If you somehow had a magical bias preserving C0 gate, such that you did not convert I or Z errors to I or X errors, then a Z error will only create syndromes in the horizontal direction uh, and not in the vertical direction. That would actually give you, would have given you a higher threshold. So when uh, Jeff asked me, uh, well, should I get any advantage from this system? My first answer was no as well, you're getting syndromes all over the place, so why should you get any advantage? Um, fortunately, Jeff did not listen to me, and we did still do the calculation. And we actually did find uh, that we got a large threshold advantage. So the orange line is the threshold uh, versus the erasure fraction. So again, the right-hand side is large erasure, left-hand side is basically polynoise. Um, so th the orange line, is uh, if I had bias erasures, but the native gate set shown over here, I get an increase in the threshold uh, as a function of the, uh, of the erasure bias. The uh, blue dots are if I did not have any erasure bias to begin with, in the sense that my erasure errors were a mixed uh, X, Y, Z type erasures to begin with. That's the general erasure model. Um, Clearly, the, the orange dots are higher than the blue dots, and it's specifically for a 98% erasure fraction that we expect to have in the system, uh, the uh, threshold comes out to be about 7.5%, which is pretty good. Okay. So why is this actually happening? Why, why, why were... That's, that's for, oh, that's, uh, sorry, that's for the... Uh, circuit, circuit level, level noise. noise, yeah. Um, 
for just memory, yeah? Just memory, that's right. Um, so why is this actually, why is this improving? Like, why, why was I wrong? Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, I don't have a good explanation, but better explanation than saying that the decoder basically has the knowledge that uh, the X errors could only happen like in the C0 gate and the Z errors can only happen in the C phase gate. So the kind of search space for the decoder is now smaller and so it still gives an uh, improvement. Um, if you actually had the bias preserving C0 gate, this improvement would even be higher. But to begin with, I did not imagine it would increase this much at all. Thanks. Okay. Um, so for polynoids, again, the threshold is 1%. For pure erasures, the threshold would have been 10.3% versus 5%. Uh, and for our uh, RE of 98%, the threshold is about 8% or so. OK, so we can also look at the logical error rate. So we plot the logical error rate versus different physical error prob probabilities. Uh, the dark uh, blue lines, sorry, the, the solid lines are for uh, unbiased erasures. And the dashed lines are just for polynoids. And here the erasure fraction is 98%. And you're clearly seeing that you get a large logical error rate advantage. So even for a uh, physical error probability of 1%, you almost see like an order of magnitude reduction or more in the logical error rate. Now, if you actually just compare um, in, in this other plot, the dashed lines are actually uh, unbiased erasures and the solid lines are biased erasures. So with biased erasures, you even get uh, lower logical error rates. So basically, it's again saying that for the same size of the code, you get more bang for your buck. Um, okay, so what was the annoying thing about this? The annoying thing is that you're mixing X and Z errors. That means that unfortunately, you cannot change the aspect ratio of the surface code. You have to use a square surface code because the uh, amount of horizontal syndromes is the same as the vertical syndromes, and so you need, need a square code. So you kind of lose that advantage of the XZX surface code. The other little annoying thing is that you need an active reloading of Atom. So like when we see an erasure, you have to stop everything. We have to like reload the Atom and then continue with the gates. So you know, even though we can do re reloading in principle, it's still kind of slow. Uh, so we want to avoid doing that. And we also want to somehow be able to use the uh, rectangular XZX surface code to get a better uh, overhead advantage. So in order to do this, we actually had to go to a measurement-based approach. or um, Nowadays, people call it the fusion-based approach, but they're, they're all the same. It's all teleportation-based. OK, so let's quickly look at the teleport, teleportation based error correction. Now, some of you, yeah. Because of your loading, can you do the pumping? Yeah. Yeah. And that's not improved anything? Uh, improve the speed or something? I mean, it's still slow. And yeah, you, you're kind of like slowing every everything down. It still takes time, many seconds or something. Um, OK. So uh, when I was talking to the students around, I found out that not everybody was familiar with this teleportation-based error correction idea, so some of these slides will be boring, uh, but just bear with me, and I'll tell you to wake up again when the important parts come up. Okay, so uh, teleportation is easy. Suppose I have, a, I have a state, I say I have an atom, I'm worried that it's gonna be lost out of the trap and I wanna keep it for a longer time. I, so I wanna teleport its state to some other qubit. So I'll prepare uh, a bell state like this, this is just a simple example from uh, I can, uh, Nielsen and Chuang. And uh, now what I, after preparing this bell state, I do a control phase gate between the uh, input state and one of uh, the first pair, uh, one of the qubits over here, and measure them in the X spaces. That teleports the input state to the output qubit with some poly corrections that depend on the X measurement outcomes here. Now, how would I have prepared this state? Well, one way to prepare this state is I have prepared two qubits in the plus state and do a control phase gate between the two. In fact, I could uh, do this control phase gate and this control phase gate in parallel. So I could have the input state, just prepare two other qubits in the plus state, do my control phase gate, measure the first two qubits in the X spaces, 
that teleports the state to the third qubit. This is a short cluster state, 1D cluster state. Um, uh, you can do this many more times, or just have a long, longer 1D cluster state. Um, and again, uh, prepare the other qubits in the plus state, do your control phase gates, measure all but the last qubit in the X spaces. So the state is teleported to the last qubit up to some polycorrections. Okay, fantastic. And by the way, all our understanding of, or at least all my understanding of measurement-based quantum computing comes from Ben's uh, very nice paper. That's how we learned it, so please go take a look at that. Um, yeah, so this is the 1D cluster state. Another way to actually do this teleportation is instead of measuring uh, x, x here after doing the control phase gate, I could have just measured x, uh, z, x, and x, z on the two qubits. It's the same thing. Like this is just, you know, you can just commute this x through. So x measurement here after the control phase gate is actually an x, z measurement before the control phase gate. So just by uh, moving the measurements through before the control phase gate, I could have just as well done the teleportation by measuring these two body operators, which are, which are basically Bell measurements, uh, and these are called as fusions. So now, if I wanted to teleport a longer chain, I would just maybe just prepare, you know, um, your, your input Bell states like this, and I measure the neighboring qubits in the Bell basis, uh, and I just teleport the input state to the output state over here, again, having some polycorrections. Uh, maybe instead of making these two qubit bell uh, states, I could have instead made three qubit G and Z states and uh, now fused uh, the neighboring qubits like so, and the, the qubit in the middle gets uh, measured in the X spaces. It's all the same thing. It's all teleportation. It's all I'm doing. Um, and then everything gets teleported here. Like I said, this is just called fusion measurement or bell basis measurement. So that's it. Now you understand fusion-based quantum computing. Now the idea is that as your states are being teleported through your chain, either with fusions or whatever way you want to, while you're teleporting the state, you want to also measure some stabilizers to do air correction. Suppose that process is called as foliation. Uh, let's explain foli foliation with a simple example of the repetition code. So I have my you know, three uh, 1D cluster states. Um, which is basically teleporting three effective qubit states. And now I want to measure, say, the XX stabilizers between the pairs of uh, qubits. I just put these extra qubits at the center over here, do more control phase gates, and measure everything in the X spaces. The measurement outcomes of this, uh, uh, the measurement outcome of this qubit here actually tells you the X1, X2 correlation between the two chains of the qubits going across. Um, so you can also think about this as a repetition code foliated in time. So this part is a rep repetition code at time t1, this is at time t2, and this is at time t3. Uh, the way you actually do error correction is to multiply the product of these four uh, x outcomes. And this is because uh, usually you just compare the measurement outcome of one repetition code with the measurement outcome of the same re repetition code at a later time. But remember, as we were going through, we were also picking up some poly corrections. So to account for those polycorrections, you don't compare this with this. You compare this with this modulo, these two measurement outcomes, that's it. OK, uh, so the foliated, uh, this, this is the foliated repetition code. The foliated C CSS surface code is your RG cluster state. OK, so now how do you do this in the fusion-based technique? It kind of looks like this. So you just have. Uh, a bigger block of um, resource states that you prepare instead of like just, you know, three qubit or two qubit, qubit GHZ states, you prepare like say eight qubit GHZ state, for example, here. And then you just fuse your nearest neighbor qubits with each other and these middle qubits just get measured in the X spaces. That's it. The left side is same as right hand side, just done in a slightly fancier way. Um, so if you know, for example, what PsyQuantum, the company PsyQuantum does, they do fusion-based quantum computing. This is what they're doing. Uh, so uh, there's a little bit of problem here. This is an example of a repetition code which corrects for Z-noise. So if I only had Z-noise in my system, 
then technically this should be enough to do everything. However, as you teleport, you're actually converting Z noise to X noise. Why? Because physical Z noise will affect your X measurement outcomes. It will also affect your XZ and ZX measurement outcomes. It will also affect your bell basis measurement. That means that the poly corrections that you uh, uh, apply are going to be wrong. Both poly X corrections are going to be wrong and poly Z corrections are going to be wrong. Poly Z corrections being wrong is okay because that's Z noise, but poly X correction being wrong means that you're introducing X noise in the system. So this teleportation is actually not a bias preserving teleportation and it, it converts physical Z noise to logical uh, X noise. So that means this is clearly out of the question. I cannot use this uh, technique uh, to efficiently uh, correct for bias Z noise. What do I do? Well, I just change the way I do teleportation. Instead of doing teleportation with uh, control phase gates, I do teleportation with control not gates. Solution is very simple. Here, um, I prepare a slightly different bell state, which is 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Instead of plus 0, plus minus 1, I prepare 0, 0, plus 1, 1. That bell state can be prepared, for example, by preparing one qubit in the plus state, the other qubit in the zero state, and doing a control not gate. Simple. And now here, to teleport this state, I do the control not the other way. Notice that the knots are on the same qubit. So these two control not gates can, in principle, be done in parallel. Now I measure the first qubit in the x basis, the second qubit in the z basis, and I get my correction over here. Importantly, what's happening is that the z measurement outcomes apply the x correction. That means that a physical z error will never corrupt a z measurement outcome. That means I will never apply an incorrect x to my state. That means my noise is going to remain preserved. So this is an example of a longer uh, teleportation chain. You have your input qubit. You have a bunch of other qubits prepared in the um, plus state and the zero state. So the dots, the fill circles are prepared in the plus states. The big circles are prepared in the uh, zero state. And you do control not gates with the not always happening on the open circle qubits. Um, and then you measure the open circle qubits in the z basis the closed circle qubits in the uh, x basis, and you teleport your input state to the output state. So now this teleportation chain never converts z errors to x errors. Um, you can again do the uh, trick of fusions, where you now commute uh, the x measurement you know, before the c naught gates and the z measurements also before the c naught gates. So now your effective two qubit measurements becomes x, x, and z, z measurements. Still a bell basis measurement. Just a different different bell basis. And um, here, for example, uh, your your three qubit resource state for teleporting could look like this. This is actually just a JZ state. And now you fuse the nearest neighbor qubits. You fuse the Z. The, you, you fuse the open circle qubits, and you measure the closed circle qubits in the X basis. You teleport your input state to the output state over here. The X basis measurements only apply Z corrections. The Z basis measurements apply the X correction. Physical Z errors will only corrupt uh, the XX measurement outcomes, but not the ZZ measurement outcomes. That means all the Z type measurement outcomes will always obtain correctly. That means you will never apply an incorrect logical X to your qubit. So you're keeping your no uh, noise bias preserved. Okay. So uh, this is uh, now you can look at the repetition code again in this generalized foliation picture. Um, so now I have three chains. Uh, these are just like more decorated looking chains than what we had previously. Uh, again, we put these qubits at the center, uh, which are with, again C naught gates between these nearest neighbors, and measure everything. Uh, all the, do, uh, all the fill circles in the X basis, open circles in the Z basis. Uh, this is like the out measurement outcome of these center qubits is measuring X1, X2 correlations between the nearest neighbors. So you're measuring the stabilizers of your repetition code. And again, your check is product of these X measurement outcomes around each phase. Uh, oops, sorry, the animation got uh, mixed up. 
But now if you wanted to do this in like the fusion picture, your resource states will be these eight body uh, entangled states as shown over here. Um, and of course at the boundary, you, you may have like a three body state. So but the boundaries will alternate between uh, the four body states and the, sorry, the eight, eight ring states and the, the three body uh, states like so. And uh, you will fuse the, the open circle qubits and measure the closed circle qubits in the X spaces. That's it. Um, you, can, you can keep on doing this as much as you like. Um, so, sorry. Yeah. So this is the right way to uh, foliate a repetition code if you want to preserve your noise bias and actually use the noise bias for some advantage. Um, so how do you actually prepare the resource states? The noise bias works only if you have a way to prepare these resource states such that those uh, resource state preparation itself doesn't introduce X errors anywhere, as well as you have a way to do fusions, which indeed just preserves uh, the noise bias. That means you always get ZZ measurement outcome correctly, but XX can be messed up. So um, you can, the nice thing is that because these are resource states prepared in some specific state, I can do post-selection. So this is a circuit. Um, uh, which prepares, which just involves control phase gates and a few Hadamards, which prepares the resource states. And after all of these gates, you just apply your erasure conversion pulse. And if you see anything has been erased, you just throw it. Why do I need to throw it? I need to throw it because, because of this Hadamard, I might convert a Z error to an X error. So I cannot use those resource states in my, for, for teleportation. I should only use the resource states with no X errors in them for teleportation. So basically, this is one thing that I'm, I'm using post-selection to my advantage. Um, the other way, the other thing I need to ensure is that I have a way to measure the two-body XX and ZZ uh, operators, making sure that the physical Z noise only corrupts the XX measurement, but not the Z measurement. And this is the circuit that does it. So I have two qubits on which I want to measure XX or ZZ. I do control phase gates with an ancilla prepared in the plus state. I measured the ancilla and the X spaces, and that gives me the uh, ZZ measurement outcome of the two qubits. And then I measure each qubit uh, uh, in the X spaces destructively. And I just multiply the outcomes to get XX. And that's fine. These measurements can be completely destructive because I'm not using those qubits ever again in my circuit. Now, if I see an erasure here, for example, I just stop the gates, and I just go and measure the first qubit and the, uh, the qubit i and qubit j in the z basis, multiply the outcomes, and get the zz measurement. I will never get the xx measurement, but that's OK, because I'm, I'm OK to corrupt the xx measurement. I do not want to corrupt the zz measurement. And even if, for example, the erasure happened on qubit i, well, the erasure is already biased. So I already know that the qubit was measured in the one basis already. So I already know the z measurement outcome there. I only need to go measure the qubit j in that case. So this, uh, this kind of, um, this measurement feedback kind of a circuit allows me to always recover the zz measurement outcome correctly. Uh, okay, so this is the main idea, which I will now use to foliate my XZZX uh, surface code. So let's look at the XZZX surface code. The XZZX surface code is just the repetition code along this direction. And it is kind of doing ZZ measurements between those repetition codes vertically. So for every blue line, I will have my eight ring resource state. So for this blue line, for, I have this planar uh, eight, uh, arrangement of eight, uh, eight ring resource states. For the next blue line, I have another planar arrangement of uh, eight ring resource states, and they are on top of each other, they are staggered, which means that this square actually appears on top of this guy over here. It ensures that even with this arrangement, it's ensured that all the black dot qubits lie on top of each other. And so now to get these vertical connections, I'll just do a control phase gates between the black dot qubits that are lying on top of each other. And that's it. This is the uh, XZ, XZZX cluster state in a fusion picture. All this is slightly hand wavy, 
way to explain what's going on. All the details can be found in our paper, but there's no way to explain all of it uh, if you don't already know what it is uh, in the short time we have. Okay. So we did our simulations uh, and compared how this uh, XZX surface code in the foliation picture compares with you know, the regular circuit-based error correction where you put in select qubits and just measure stabilizers over and over again. So let's actually just focus on these two rows. So we have the circuit-based biased erasures with native gates. That means that you know, your C0 gate was converting Z errors to X errors and so on. For an erasure fraction of 98%, the threshold was about 8.2%. Uh, 8 with our hybrid fusion gates, the threshold is 10.3%. It's not a big, I mean, going from 8.2 to 10.3% is not amazing, but it's, it's good. And in fact, it, if you had a bias preserving C0 gate, you would actually have got slightly less threshold than 10.3. That was a little bit surprising uh, fact, but uh, well, it is what it is. Uh, more importantly though, because all our, everything is biased, we can actually use a rectangular X XZZX surface code and save on overheads. So that's a big advantage. Um, the other nice thing is that as you know, atom loss is a big problem. So this measurement-based approach automatically takes care of atom loss. It just converts atom loss to poly errors. Uh, you know, it, it gets detected. The atom gets measured out in the end. You bring a fresh atom in. So that's nice. Um, it also avoids mid-circuit atom replacement. That means if I, if I see an erasure, I don't have to bring a fresh atom in and do something else. I can just, you know, continue with my protocol. I don't have to replace the atom ever again. So because I'm, I, I'm assuming I have a resource state factory that's just generating resources at a, at a fixed rate. That kind of allows me to go around this problem of mid-circuit uh, atom replacement. So uh, this teleportation-based approach in general is very, very nice for the neutral atom platform. Okay, so this is my last slide. In summary, I showed you how to do erasure conversion in Rydberg atoms. You get high thresholds. You can, uh, if you do the fusion-based approach, you can also get low overheads. Um, so after a paper on uh, erasure conversion in Rydberg atoms, there was a lot of excitement, and other platforms also tried to design their own erasure qubits. So there was uh, Ken Brown's work on erasure qubits in trapped ions in superconducting circuits. There are many, many proposals, and they've also demonstrated erasure conversion in their papers. The difference, and I think the nice thing about the neutral atoms and the superconducting erasure qubits is that in superconducting erasure qubits, if you do nothing, erasure is happening. In neutral atoms, if you do nothing, basically nothing is happening. It, the erasure only happens when you actually try to do the two qubit gate. Um, so these are all, all the papers. Um, also, I'm gonna mention that this idea of using resource states to do something interesting uh, is, is you know, more widely applicable. More recently, we used it to actually uh, mitigate this temporal uh, fra fragile boundary problem in the uh, XY surface codes. If you're interested in that, just check it out or come talk to me later. This idea of preparing resource states is pretty cool. Yeah. Which ones are biased erasures? Because that's an important distinction, right? Uh, so none of these are biased erasures? Neutral atoms. Just the neutral atom is a bias. So I don't know about trapped on. I should go check. But the neutral atom for sure is. I think the only bias erasure one, but I, I need to check. Yeah. Super connecting ones, none of them are bias erasure. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. Let's start. Very nice talk. Um, you mentioned uh, kind of the fast disruptive measurement earlier in the talk, um, but I guess you would still need to move atoms in this up. You don't have to move it like far away because you're not worried about scattered photons because you know it's at a different frequency. Right, but I guess you would still assume they have like some kind of resource state generators that then. You could... Yeah. So the idea, like the architecture in mind, is like you know you have a place where you're doing resource state factories. Again, it doesn't actually have to necessarily be hundreds of microns or farther away. It can be just be a few microns away because I'm not worried about scattered photons. I also have a question. Um, so if you have to balance, uh, so you mentioned resource states are prepared via post selection and then 
Um, on the other hand, the circuit proceeds at a certain rate, and that rate is governed by both agile laws as well as gate speeds. Uh, do these two rates have to match up? And are they comparable? Yeah, so I think the slowest speed, the slowest thing is the measurements, just 20 microseconds. The gates are fast. I forgot to mention it's like hundreds of nanoseconds. Um, so is, is uh, the 20 microsecond uh, measurement speed. So you want to have the resource state generation time be up to, uh, it, not generation time, the resource state generation rate has to match the uh, 20 microsecond um, measurement rate. So you know the time it takes to generate each resource state, the slowest part of generating each resource state is also the 20 microsecond erasure check. So the, the rate at which I'm generating resource states is similar to the measurement time. So the factory doesn't actually have to be too large. Okay, it can be decently small. Yeah, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I had a question about this atom replacement column. So one thing that I think I understand is that, in fact, now you are replacing every atom, every step. So but not mid-circuit. So, it's so, so the, okay, so in the traditional circuit-based approach, you measure the stabilizer. Say in gate number two, you saw there was an erasure. You come and put the atom back in before you do gate number three. All the calculations done so far assume that you're doing this. Maybe there's some leeway. You don't actually replace the atom immediately. Maybe you're replaced after the whole stabilizer measurement or after five stabilizer measurements. Of course, that's going to bring a cost with it, right? So uh, there, in the best... Uh, in the scenarios where we have calculated the highest thresholds and so on, we assume that you come and replace the atoms after every gate if they're lost. This doesn't actually, you, uh, you have to stop everything else and come replace the atoms. So that means that if atom replacement takes one millisecond, your cycle time is proportional to one millisecond. Here, the cycle time is not proportional to one millisecond, the cycle time is proportional to 20 microseconds because that's the clock speed now. Okay. But it's very like hungry unit. Yeah, yeah. So we are we are trading. Yeah, we are, we are trading like time for space, like the resource state factory space. Yeah. Okay. So if your atoms are cheap, which I'm said they are, <laughs> but uh, it should be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess so. In this kind of fusion part, uh, you mentioned the need to do kind of know the result, know that you saw an array and then feed forward. Uh, how big of a difference does that make? And I guess if, if for various timing considerations or whatnot, you didn't want to do that, um, could you still somehow get still most of the performance there? Um, so the, again, the slowest time is 20 microseconds, right? Like say your erasure conversion takes 20 microseconds. So that's the time. Like you need to, your, you need to be ready to do the next X or Z measurement uh, within 20 microseconds. I believe that that's, not that fast of a time scale, like FPGAs will be able to respond in, in that time. So that should be okay. Um, and you're asking if there's a way to avoid that? Um, I don't. How much performance sacrifice do you get if you don't? So if I don't do that, the whole procedure fails in the sense that it will, it will, it will look very similar to the circuit based approach because all my bias will be lost then. So if I want to maintain the bias and take advantage of rectangular codes and all of that stuff, I, I need to kind of do it. Is it easy to identify R sub E on the device? Can that be engineered around? Is it easy to do what? Identify R sub E, that, that, that erasure contract. Oh, erasure fraction? Uh, you mean like, can you do benchmarking essentially? Just yeah, to yeah, measure it? typical values, I guess. So, so uh, right, so like they did it in the experiment. So it's not that hard to kind of benchmark uh, uh, erasures. Um, so in the current experiment, like I said, it was not that great, fifty percent, because you, you they were not they didn't have the lasers or whatever to like actually measure the other places that the Rydberg atom was going to, which in principle is possible. They just need the right equi equipment for it. Okay. So yeah, but don't take my word for it. I know that the experiments are going to come out. So. All right. Well, uh, uh, any other questions we can have during the discussion session? Uh, 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 so let's thank Shruti again.